After five months of closed-door investigation, of talking in private with intelligence agents and officials, most of the senators now agree with Chairman Frank Church that the CIA has indeed been a rogue elephant out of control. Most people hear MK Ultra and think almost exclusively about brainwashing, mind control, and interrogation, but I want to cover something a bit different today. When MKUltra was brought to the public by the Church Committee in 1975, to some it was already old news. Conspiracy radio shows and fringe political groups had already taken notice of some of the project, and a 1974 New York Times article by Seymour Hersh had, had put a light on the CIA's actions. People who claimed the government was drugging people and attempting to control the minds of unknowing citizens would have been called crazy, conspiracy theorists, or even un-American. Looking back, we know they were correct. MKUltra was a covert project by the CIA started in the 1950s. Its main goal was to develop techniques for mind control and behavior manipulation, which the CIA believed would give them an edge in interrogation and intelligence gathering during the Cold War. The program involved testing various methods, including the use of drugs like LSD, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, and psychological torture on unsuspecting subjects. One notorious subproject of MKUltra was called Midnight Climax. This part of the program involved setting up brothels in San Francisco and New York, where CIA operatives would secretly dose clients with LSD. The operatives would then observe the effects of the drug on behavior and gather intelligence in a controlled environment. I will assume that most of the people watching this know a good deal of the MKUltra story, and eventually we will give it a more in-depth look on the channel. But for now I want to put a light on a lesser spoken about project that was birthed during the time of MKUltra. It would be allegedly closed as a project after it was brought to light, although I do not see much to make me believe that. The project we are talking about today is MK Naomi. MK Naomi operated alongside MK Ultra. Unlike MK Ultra, which focused on mind control and behavioral manipulation, MK Naomi primarily dealt with biological and chemical weapons research and development. The project aimed to develop lethal substances for covert operations, including toxins and poisons that could be used in assassinations and sabotage. An article published September 16th in the New York Times written by Seymour Harak is often missed by people looking at the MKUltra story and its surrounding impact. This article covers a Senate Select Committee on Intelligence meeting with William Coby, the Director of Intelligence. During the meeting, he would state MK Naomi was halted in 1970. One notable aspect of MK Naomi spoken about in the meeting was the development of a dart gun that could deliver a lethal toxin or drug to a target without immediate detection. These dart guns were designed to be silent and efficient, allowing operatives to administer substances from a distance with precision. The CIA called the dart gun a non-discernible microbinoculator. Say that five times fast. Saxitoxin, one of the agents stockpiled by the CIA, was designed to be used with the darts. It is commonly called shellfish toxin and causes heart attacks, among other things. The subject today concerns CIA's involvement in the development of bacteriological warfare materials with the Army's biological laboratory at Fort Detrick. CIA's retention of, a num of an amount of shellfish toxin and CIA's use and investigation of various chemicals and drugs. The relationship between the CIA and the Army Biological Laboratory at Fort Detrick as an activity requiring further investigation surfaced in late April of this year. It resulted from information provided by a CIA, CIA officer not directly associated with the project in response to my repeated directives that all past activities which might now be considered questionable be brought to the attention of agency management. Information provided by him and by two other officers aware of the project indicated that the project at Fort Detrick involved the development of bacteriological warfare agents, some lethal, 
and associated delivery systems suitable for clandestine use. A search was made for any records or other information available on the project. This search produced information about the basic agreement between the Army and the CIA relating to the project and some limited records covering its activities from its beginning in 1952 to its termination in 1970. In the course of the investigation, CIA's laboratory storage facilities were searched and about 11 grams, a little less than half an ounce, of shellfish toxin and 8 milligrams of cobra venom were discovered in a little-used, vaulted storeroom in an agency building. At the time the toxin was found, the officer responsible for the project in 1970 stated that he had no recollection as to how it got there. On the 30th of June, discussions were held with a retired agency officer who had provided the initial lead. This man, who had been the GS-15 branch chief in 1970, stated that the toxin had in fact been moved from Fort Detrick and stored in the laboratory. This was done on the basis of his own decision after conversations with the responsible project officer. He further stated that he made this decision based on the fact that the cost and difficulty of isolating the shellfish toxin were so great that it simply made no sense to destroy it, particularly when there would be no future source of such toxin. The current branch chief believes this explanation is correct, but still does not recall the actual act of receiving the material from Fort Detrick. Both of these middle grade officers agree that no, no one, including their immediate superior, was told of the retention of the shellfish toxin. If that amount of shellfish toxin were administered orally, which is one of the least efficient ways for administering it in terms of its lethality, that quantity was sufficient to kill at least uh, 14,000 people. If it were administered uh, with the sophisticated uh, equipment that was found in the laboratory, that quantity would be sufficient to kill a great many more. Estimates vary upwards into the hundreds of thousands. Now, my first question is why did the agency prepare a shellfish toxin for which there is no practical antidote, which attacks the nervous system and brings on death very quickly. Why did the agency prepare toxins of this character in quantities sufficient to kill many thousands of people. What was the need for that in the first place, long before the presidential order came down to destroy this material? I think the, uh, the first uh, part of the answer to that question, Mr. Chairman, is the, the fact that the L pill, which was developed and, and during World War II, does take some time to work and is particularly agonizing to the subject who uses it. Uh, the, some of the people who would be natural uh, requesters of such a capability for their own protection and the protection of their fellow agents really would not want to face that kind of a fate. But if they could be given an instantaneous one, they would uh, accept that. And that was the thought process behind developing the capability. Now, I cannot uh, explain why that quantity was developed, except that this was a collaboration that we were engaged in with the United States Army uh, and we did develop this particular weapon, you might say, as a possible, uh, for possible use. Now, when CIA retained the amount that it did, it obviously did it improperly. This quantity, um, and the various devices for administering the toxin that were found in the laboratory, certainly make it clear that purely defensive uses were not um, what the agency 
uh, had, had, uh, was limited to in any way. There were definite offensive uses. In fact, there were dart guns. You mentioned suicide. Well, I, I, I don't think a, a suicide is usually accomplished with a dart. Uh, particularly a gun that can can uh, place the dart in a human target in such a way that he doesn't even know that he's been hit. There's no question about it. It was also for offensive reasons. No question. Have you brought with you um, some of those devices which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for... We have indeed. ...for killing people... Don't point it at me. <laughs> I wonder if, if it's good. Now, does does this does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. The uh, that the round thing at the top is obviously the sight. The rest of it is uh, what is practically a, uh, a normal 45, although it's, a, it's special. It, however, it, it works by electricity. There's a battery in the handle, and it sh fires a small dart. So that when it fires, it fires silently? Almost silently, yes. Uh, very little. Very what little. range does it have? 100 meters. 100 meters, I believe, about. About 100 yards, 100 meters. About a hundred meters range, right. and the dart itself, when it strikes the the, the uh, target, um, does the uh, target know that he's about that he's been hit and about to die? That depends, Mr. Chairman, on the particular dart used. There are different kinds of these flechettes uh, that were used in in uh, various weapon systems, and a special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. Without perception, right? And did you find such such darts in the library in, in, in the laboratory? We did. Yes. Isn't it true too that um, the the effort not only involved designing a gun that could strike a, a human target without knowledge of the person who'd been struck, but also the toxin itself would not appear in the autopsy? Well, there, there was an attempt to... Or the to dart? Make, yes, so that uh, there was no, no way of perceiving that the, uh, the target was hit. As a murder instrument, that's about as efficient as you can get, isn't it? It, it, it is a weapon, a very serious weapon. Saxitoxin actually has a connection to my home of Alaska. A recent article I found had some interesting information. It says that at the Kodiak Area Marine Science Symposium, oceanographer Patricia Tester said she might know where the poison known as saxitoxin came from. Saxitoxin causes paralytic selfish poisoning. It paralyzes muscles by interfering with signals from the body which can stop respiration. Tester says she learned about saxitoxin experiments from a trove of documents found in Kodiak, Alaska that revealed tests on mice in the 1950s involving shellfish toxins. The research was conducted in a facility in Ketchikan that no longer exists. The documents Tester reviewed include a contract for clams and a shipping receipt to the U.S. Army Biological Warfare Laboratories at Fort Detrick in Maryland. In one of the files, there was a Department of Defense contract for toxic shellfish. And this is what led to the detective journey that brought us through the Cold War history. The contract was from the Department of Defense, and it was for toxic clams, written on October 6, 1952. The contract was for $10,000 of toxic clams, closer to $100,000 today, to be shipped to the East Coast. The Senate Select Committee on Intelligence meeting also made public that the CIA was stockpiling many agents for biological warfare uses and study. 
Toxins like botulinum toxin, ricin, and pathogens like anthrax and Q fever. They also stockpiled venoms from animals such as snakes, spiders, and other venomous creatures that were of interest due to their potential to incapacitate or kill targets when delivered in a covert manner. Many of the stockpiled agents could be used to kill mass crops. What I want to make clear is that MK Ultra was about mind control and brainwashing, and MK Naomi was a project running at the same time to create covert ways to kill targets. It would fit that the plan here was to create people through MK Ultra to use methods developed out of MK Naomi to take out targets without even needing to use official federal agents, as now regular citizens can be altered into government drones to work as unknowing agents for US intelligence and the military. We know that the MKUltra documents were destroyed on purpose by the government, and with it much of MK Naomi. We will never really know if these programs came to an end, and with everything happening today in the world I would argue they haven't. MK Naomi is most definitely just as important to investigate as MKUltra as these two projects in my opinion are tied to the same goal of creating killers. I will definitely have some more videos on this era of CIA and military insanity, as well as how it all got kicked off in the first place during and post World War II. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe, leave me a comment and all that. You know what, material, what documents he destroyed? We're very unsure as to the total. We do not have an inventory of them. Do you think they might have said who it was authorized the <coughs> formulation or the retention of this stuff? Do you have any reason to think it might or might not contain that information? In this case, I, I doubt that it would have very much because this uh, case indicates from the evidence we have at hand. Does it say it anything, is, have any reason to think that it might say how, if at all, this material was used in an aggressive way against someone to kill someone? Well, there may well be some of that in, in the, when was the When was the documentation destroyed? In 1973. In the, it didn't happen to be destroyed at the same time those tapes. That's 1972. 1972. 1972. When in 1972? In November, I believe it was. In November of 72. Do you have any idea what volume of records were destroyed? I do not know. Do you know who authorized the destruction, if anyone? As I said, there was a memorandum of agreement between the, the uh, director and, and Mr. Gottlieb at that time. And the director at that time was? Mr. Helm.